questions were established in Eden, what is your immediate response? Marriage and sex. Right, but wrong. <laughs> you know why? It used to be right. You can't say that anymore. Because even in the United States, when you say marriage, what do you mean? <laughs> ah, you know what's happening. My own country, South Africa, was the first non-Western nation to say yes, 2005, to gay marriage. When you say marriage, you don't mean what my country means, correct? You don't mean what they mean up north in Canada. When they say marriage, they mean something else. Are you with me? In the United States, you can still say marriage, although it's happening in many more states, including New York now, where it's fully legal for two men to be involved in what the Bible calls abomination that New York calls a marriage. <laughs> okay? Am I right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You follow what I'm saying? So we can't use that term anymore. Yes, we did use it before, but nowadays when we say marriage, we have to say monogamous, heterosexual, interfaith, and during. <laughs> we have to identify what we mean by the term because it's not polygamous marriage. And incidentally, for those interested, uh, my first uh, child, see, my first child was called polygamy in the Bible. Uh, Richard Davidson was my chair, and I wrote on this whole topic, which is a contentious issue, and I was going back to Africa, which I did as a missionary, and the big issue of polygamy, what do you do with the polygamists? So they are beautiful, incredible biblical answers. I didn't even know all of this stuff until I dug, and I found out that, guess what, the prophet is never wrong. Ellen White called polygamy a violation of the seventh commandment. She's right. Study the Bible. It's amazing. And she says that David and these guys repented, and I thought, wow, it's all there. David, Jacob, Solomon, David, uh, David, Jacob, Solomon, Jacob, David, Solomon, David, Abraham, the four, big four, they're called the big four polygamists. They all stopped their polygamy. Did you know that? They gave up their practice of polygamy, they were reconverted, and they took care of their wives and children. Fascinating. How many of you knew that? I didn't expect that. I didn't either. <laughs> so that's why we dig deeply and I provide the biblical evidence. That's what I studied there. So that's why I want to qualify this. When we say marriage, we mean that. In the same way now, that is, we cannot say Sabbath anymore. We have to identify it's the seventh day. It's not lunar. Remember that? That's what's happening now. Okay? It's not the first day of the week. It's creation based. It's not on the moon, sun and moon or whatever. Uh, on, the, on the moon, rather. It's based upon the creator setting it aside. It's blessed and it's holy and it's a weekly Sabbath. Feast keepers say, oh, I keep the annual Sabbaths. When we say Sabbath, we have to identify. So pastors, the next time somebody asks you that question, what are the two institutions that come from Eden? What are you going to say? Monogamous, heterosexual, interfaith, enduring marriage, and Seventh-day creation-based, blessed and holy weekly Sabbath. Do you get what I'm saying? You have to flesh it out as needed. Otherwise, people are putting their own meaning on these terms. And so we take them back to Genesis 2, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and we gave, give them that. And so when we have Bible studies, we don't jump into Exodus and the Ten Commandments. We take them back to creation. We take them, then we take them through eventually to the fourth commandment, and we give them kind of a whole sweep. And then we get to this problem text. Now, why do we call it the problem text? Amazingly, this one passage, and I'm using the Revised Standard Version only for ill illustrative purposes. It just happens that the Revised Standard Version, which is one of the more common Bibles on this text, has done a very good job of translating literally. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Now, why am I spending time on this text when my topic is feast keeping? Interesting. <laughs> Here is the answer. I, I was at 3 a.m. in 2007 and did a presentation on this topic, just this verse. Intending to try to reach non Seventh day Adventists, Sunday keepers, and, when, and I mentioned in passing, my focus, by the way, was the last word, as you can imagine, that final word, Sabbath. And I happened to mention that the festivals, the new moons, and the ceremonial Sabbaths are all done. They are obsolete. They've been fulfilled by Christ. I couldn't believe it. I got a ream, and I'm not, a pile, a pile of material from feast keepers, Adventists. I was like, wow. I stirred up unintentionally a hornet's nest, as they say. And I got a lot of material from feast keepers. Including one guy who even said, Ron Dupre, if he continues, is in danger of capital punishment. <laughs> a veiled threat. From a Muslim perspective, it was a fatwa. You know what a fatwa is? Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a kind of a death decree that was placed upon me. So Permanent. If, if he continues to speak against the holy days, perpetual. 
Okay? He got perpetual uh, death decree on me because I spoke against the holy days. I mean, these folk are, are passionate, as Jacques Toucan says. They're really passionate. And they, in a veiled threat, I am in danger of capital punishment. And why? Why? Because this passage, according to them, they actually wrote, they said, this passage is the most important verse in the whole Bible for the continuation of the feast days. Mm. Did you get that? The most important. Why? Well, what's the logic? They, may, they believe that this is the seventh day Sabbath. That's their belief. Sunday keepers hold the same. Sunday keepers and feast keepers within the Adventist church say this is the seventh day Sabbath. Well, do we keep the Sabbath? Yes. 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 And notice what's with the festival and movement. The three stand or fall together. There's their logic. You see that? And because we keep the Sabbath, which they claim this is here, and where did they get it? <clears throat> Same book. Okay? They go to Strong's. And it was published in the Adventist Review by a woman who's a feast keeper, and she wrote to them and said, Strong's says, Sabbath is seventh day Sabbath, and Colossians 2 16 is the Sabbath, and we keep the Sabbath, therefore we should keep feasts and rewards. You see that? You see why this is an important text? Uh -huh. Now you understand why I'm going to that. Okay. And by the way, this has been a challenge for 1,800 years. Irenaeus, living 130 to 200, said, It is displeasing to the Lord for Christians to keep feast day or new moons or the Sabbath, according to Colossians 2 16. Hence, we are not to observe the seventh day Sabbath any longer. For 1,800 years, folks, that text has been used to throw out the Sabbath. Shortly after it was written, 100 years after it was written or so, century after, it has been used to attack the Sabbath. And that's why we're going to spend a little time on it here today. Modern challenges have come to us, like by uh, Carol. This passage is the death blow to all sects, SDAs, for example, who observe the seventh-day Sabbath. Riegel says Paul refutes all the theories of Sabbatarians, and by the way, Riegel is used by none other than the former Adventist pastor, Bible teacher by the name of Dale Ratzlaff. Yeah. He is promoting and handing out Riegel's book on the Sabbath, because this is what Riegel claims. And then, of course, Lafley says, Colossians 2.16 says the Sabbath is not what? Binding. binding. It's not binding. Okay. So, that's why I want to spend a little time, but I know it's like the Rosetta Stone again, Champollion, takes so much time to dig into it. This text is uh, one of the texts that causes us to really dig deep. And so, I want to show you what has happened over the past uh, few years. Now, how many of you know the late Dr. Hans Laurendell, or maybe even took a class from him? Don't be afraid to raise your hands. Oh, about half of you have heard of Hans, Hans Laurendell. He died just this year, uh, I think it was this year, February, March. Pastor, uh, Dr. Laurendell passed away, really? uh, and I was just, uh, I was a student in his class at the seminary, doctoral class called the Doctor of the Sabbath, so he said, Ron, what, call, what paper do you want to write? And I'd heard of the issue of Colossians 2.16, and I said, I want to write a paper in Colossians 2.16 and see what I can find. Now, I'm not going to mention names. If you want to ask me later on, I can talk, tell you who it is, but I began to dig into this topic, into the book of a very well-known scholar who was a, a wrote on the issue of the Sabbath. And in his dissertation, he dealt with this, and he maintains that Colossians 2.16 is seventh-day Sabbaths. <laughs> Well-known scholar. And another guy who wrote his master's thesis at Andrews University, and then he became chair of the religion part, he became dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, PhD in New Testament. He says it's a seventh-day Sabbath, contrary to what we have in our 28 Fundamentals book. So these were two well-known professors who were saying that, and so forth. I read their work, and I thought, wow, powerful arguments. Admission, folks, as I read them, I said, mm -hmm. I can't refute this. So I switched my view from ceremonial Sabbaths, the standard Adventist view, I switched from ceremonial Sabbaths based upon the writings of these two scholars, and I said, mm, I'll have to believe it's the seventh day in the text, and I don't know what to do, but, and so when I wrote the introduction to my paper for Dr. Laurendell's class, I said, hmm, there are still lessons for salvation we can find. Then something happened. For the next two weeks, I went into the text itself. Instead of simply following, as Ellen White warns, professors of theology or pastors, yeah. Ellen White says, watch out, we, are, we make mistakes and we are not the ones to follow. Go back to the word, dig deeply. I spent the next two weeks digging deeply and I found out that both of these guys were wrong. They hadn't done their homework. Amen. They were quoting other non evidence scholars. <laughs> It's like, whoa, all of us have to do our homework. And the funny thing is, I found out that one of these scholars, I had been selling his books in Africa, doing him a favor, not realizing I was selling heresy. 
So yeah, I have done some unwise things, not even knowing what I was doing. You know, sometimes, but thank God he overlooks the times of our ignorance, right? Amen. 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 So yeah, I think, that, whoa, this is exciting. So now, I'm in Lauren Dell's class, I'm writing the paper, and then after that, I went and did further Bible study. I managed to find 95, and that's more now, but this is my last thing I put on the screen, 95 Bible commentary sets. I went to the Library of Congress, went to the uh, library in, in London, the uh, British Library, uh, Andrews University, searched and found 95 sets, commentary sets, looked at the book of Colossians. Guess what? Of the 95 commentaries, 91 of them, which by the way is 95% of them, 91 claim there's a triad in the text. Okay? Remember it says, let no man judge you concerning what? Feasts. Feast. And so they say, what is feast? How often does it come? They claim it comes annually. If feast is annual, next is new moon. How often does new moon come? Every month. Every month. Notice, feast, new moon, therefore, how often does Sabbath come? Aha! Are you watching what's happening? 91 out of 95 commentaries say you have a triad here of what? Annual, monthly, and weekly. Wow. Do you see the logic? Mm -hmm. But the question is not, is this logical? Is it theological? Yeah. Yeah. You get the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Logical is human. Theological is God. You follow the difference? Uh -huh. And I was reading these scholars and they were going logical. But then, what's interesting, there were four. Of the 95, four of them were saying, according to the context that includes Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, the food and drink, they are related to sacrifices. The shadows to come, this points to Christ. Feast, new moon, and Sabbath, therefore, is ceremonial Sabbath. That's the logic of four of them. But then I got the shocker. Guess what? None of the 95, and I said categorically, because I photocopied them, because people said, ah, how can you dare say that? I said, none of the 95, and I photocopied all the pages of these things that apply. None of the 95 have done any lexical, exegetical study of the passage. None. Zero. At least what's published. Now, somebody said, how do you know? I said, guys, okay, let's not quibble about it. Maybe in their scribbled notes they did exegesis. But when they published it, nothing that's been published of the 95 Bible commentary, including the other Bible commentary, shows that any of them had done any lexical exegetical study. Zero. Now, do you understand why I eventually applied for, and I'm right now working on a PhD <laughs> on this text? <laughs> because it has never been done. Somebody needs to do it. And since yeah. we don't have any children, this is our third child we're expecting. <laughs> and my, we're pregnant right now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, just so you know, the baby is due November. <laughs> In case you wanted to know, because my deadline is, no, is November 15 to have the last chapters in, I'm studying intentionally under a Dutch Reformed scholar. Why did I do that? I went outside the Adventist church because the folk who don't like us will say, ah, we knew Andrews University would come up with a dissertation that agrees with what you believe. You know how people talk about us that way? Now, there are two dissertations that just came out this year, powerful dissertations, one by Matilda Fry on the Pentateuch, on, on the Sabbath in the Pentateuch. I highly recommend it. You can get it online free. A phenomenal study by a German theologian lady, Matilda Fry, F-R-E-Y, just graduated now, June, and then another one, that's Old Testament, a new one that came out now, also in this summer, by, uh, by another German scholar, Edward Gal Galos, G-A-L-L-O-S, on Sabbatismos in Hebrews chapter 4. Family, fabulous material, which I have included in, my, in the book, which validates what we as evangelists and pastors have been saying. Guess what? The word Sabbatismos. Throughout the Christian and non-Christian literature, other than Origen, have you heard of Origen? Yes. The guy who al allegorizes the scripture, he doesn't really interpret it. He other than Origen, all Christian and non-Christian literature, whenever they use the word Sabbatismos, it always referred to a literal, actual observance of the seventh day. So Hebrews 4 is talking about the actual, <laughs> literal observance of the seventh day Sabbath. Hebrews 4 can be legitimately used for the Seventh-day Sabbath. And Gagawas' dissertation just now in August, just graduated. I was there the day he was graduating, uh, August, in, sorry, in June, um, May, end of May, early June. Uh, so those, that's the latest material that's just come out, New Testament, Old Testament. But I want you to keep up with what's been happening in the really good studies that are coming out. But unfortunately, nobody has done work on this one that you can find Anywhere, no dissertation. So I've chosen to do it, and I chose to do it under a Dutch Reformed scholar. I'm doing it in my own country of South Africa because I'm a South African still, and I get it very inexpensively. The entire PhD is going to cost me about $2,000. <laughs> so 
it's not bad, okay, <laughs> to do that also at the government institution and uh, to do that, uh, you know, under a Dutch Home Scholar. And the Lord's really been blessing me. I need your prayers. I just handed in uh, a chapter in February, uh, January this year. I was there for minister's meetings, and I handed in a chapter. And you know what? When he was done reading it, this is what he said to me. I just want to give God glory. He said, I can't believe this. He says, I read it carefully. He said, but you've produced, what you've produced is, is, is almost supernatural. <laughs> That's what he said about that chapter. I said, praise God. If my Dutch Reformed professor is excited about what to him seems almost supernatural, I hope he'll see the message and he'll join us. <laughs> okay. So keep that in mind. I appreciate your prayers. But I'm busy studying this topic. I want you to be aware of it. And I mean, you know, a challenge to... to oh, he said, I believe it's a Seventh-day Sabbath in Colossians 2. That's my professor. When I asked him to be my chair, <laughs> he says, I believe it's a step. However, in writing, however, the purpose of a dissertation is to prove what the weight of evidence from Scripture is. And I'm open to the evidence. Amen. Amen. There's my Dutch Reform professor. What? Open to the evidence. Okay, so I'm, I'm in a challenge right now, and I appreciate your prayers as I try to get this done by November. A, a word of caution on Bible commentaries. 91 commentaries claim Colossians 2 refers to the seventh day. Four say it's ceremonial. None of these 95, none dig into the text to find the meaning of the terms Feast Newman 7. 91 just assume it refers to the seventh day, and four assume it re refers to um, ceremonial Sabbath. But here's the challenge from Ellen White, Great Controversy 598. It is the first, read with me, it is the first, ready? It is the first, first and highest duty, duty of, of every, every rational, rational being. being. To learn from the scriptures what is true, and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. Now, I put the numbers in there because I thought she's got a correct one, two, three step. Number one, learn. Number two, walk. Number three, share. <laughs> so, wow, it's a powerful passage from Great Controversy 598, which, of course, corroborates Matthew 4. Jesus says, it is written, Isaiah 820, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this, there is no light in them. So we want to go there. But just an illustration of what I began to do as I dug into the text, and I want to challenge you. For example, what does the word trump mean? Trump? Anybody want to answer that? Uh, if your life is on the line, and they say, give me the right answer, or you're dead. Anybody want to take a chance? Uh, Ah, context. That's exactly right. You gotta say, give me a sentence. You can't answer the question. And so, I'll give you a sentence. Avoiding to avoid the swinging trunk, I banked the, bank the car into a trunk, damaging the trunk in the trunk without injuring my trunk. <laughs> what does trunk mean? <laughs> <laughs> now, is that true? Is that the sentence? Sentence? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is a sentence. Okay, so let's go back there. Let's add some yellow words. To avoid the swinging elephant trunk, I backed the car into a tree trunk, damaging the luggage trunk in the car trunk without injuring my body trunk. <laughs> you follow the point I'm making? So when you're studying the Bible, and you need to make sure you share this with your lay people, another reason I'm making these PowerPoints available, share this with your lay people, help them to see. They know English well enough. They can see it's funny, but it's true. One word has five meanings. And unless you have the qualifying word in front, you might get confused. Uh, the second question, what does the following sentence mean? Last year, I went to London and. If I'm asking a question, what does it mean? If I say last year, I went to London, what am I saying? The year before. What, we should, we, tell me, what's last year? What is last year? 2010. 2010, yeah, that's all I want to know. I can rephrase it, correct? In the year 2010, I went to London. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. From yeah. where we are now. Okay, yes. please don't use this PowerPoint next year, okay? They'll laugh. <laughs> okay. You know, from where we're talking now, when I say last year I went to London and it means in the year 2000, correct? Yes. Now, let's add one word, the definite article, in front of that sentence and see what happens now. The last year I went to London and, what does that mean? <laughs> ah, it changes it. Okay, so what year did I go to London? You don't know. Wait a minute. I thought I just added the definite article. Did I not add? Is this not called a definite article? What's the word the? That's a definite article. I add a definite article in front of the sentence, and now nobody knows. It's indefinite. Weird. <laughs> you get the point I'm making? Why? We understand English. And so, no one knows what it means. Just adding a definite article, the, now makes the entire sentence indefinite. People who are learning English will say, you're crazy, you English people. <laughs> But am I, is this correct grammar? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. yes. The point I'm making, one word, can change the entire meaning from definite to indefinite by adding a definite article. That's how crazy English is. Linguistic links provide the answer. 
what I want you to do is share with your congregation, and here's a classic example, using now Exodus 31. Notice what happens. Because feast keepers mix up the word Sabbath with everything. But when you study carefully, when you look for these linguistic links, the picture just begins to open up. Exodus 31, 13 through 15 gives a classic example of what we call linguistic links to identify seventh-day Sabbath. I'll show you some more further. My Sabbath you shall keep. When you see words like my, like keep, you shall keep the. When you see the word the in front of the word Sabbath, in a good translation, it always identifies seventh-day Sabbath. The is an identifier. For it is holy. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, the seventh day. Here in these three verses, there are multiple linguistic links that are always connected in some way, different words of them. When these words are present, it's always seventh-day Sabbath. Never ceremonial Sabbath. Never seventh-year sabbatical Sabbath. Okay? However, on the contrary, Luke, uh, sorry, Leviticus 23, verse 32. Now, I know there may be some of us who have <clears throat> inadvertently or perhaps disingenuously, or whatever it may be, use the, la the last part of this verse. This part here, from evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbaths. And we put the last part up on the screen to prove to people that you should keep the seven-day Sabbath from sunset to sunset. Yeah. But this is not talking about the seven-day Sabbath, no. is it? No. 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 Look at the full verse. And read before, read the context. Leviticus 23, 32, the whole verse says, it shall be to you a Sabbath. And by the way, in Hebrew, there's no uh, it's added by the translators because the word the is not there, of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your soul. Seventh-day Sabbath, you were to afflict your soul. The seventh-day Sabbath is called a day of what? Joy. Delight. Joy. It's never a day of affliction. No fasting, really. You're not supposed to fast on the Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying pastors, if you have an evangelistic crusade coming up, you may set aside one special Sabbath. But we don't want to do that as a regular thing. The seventh-day Sabbath is a day of delight. It's a day of joy. Once in a while, okay, for special occasions, very serious fasting is appropriate. But the Sabbath is not a day on which to afflict your soul. The, the Day of Atonement is a Sabbath to afflict your soul so much so that by the time you get to Acts chapter 27, verse 9, guess what? The word Day of Atonement and one word, fast, no food, became synonymous. So when Paul says, I have to get to Jerusalem by the fast, they all understood it was by what day? The Day of Atonement. The, the two became synonymous, the afflicting of the soul. But notice, on, on the ninth day of the month, at evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Interesting word right there, your. When God says, my Sabbath, he's talking about what? Seventh day. Seventh day. Okay, seventh day. He never speaks about ceremonial Sabbath as my Sabbath. Never. The words don't go together. The concept is not there. When he says your Sabbath, her Sabbath, it's Sabbath, it's ceremonial. Fascinating. And I didn't know this until I began to study deeply. And of course, I'm still back writing that paper with Dr. Laura Dell. Remember that? I changed my mind and I'm beginning to study this stuff. I'm like, wow, this is exciting stuff. In other words, God communicates with crystal clarity. He's not a God of confusion. We just haven't done our homework. We just haven't dug deep enough. There's no confusion between ceremonial Sabbath and seven-day Sabbath. It's interesting, fascinating study as I was doing this, discovering more, and so forth. Now, when I, I'll summarize that, by the way, again, you can have the PowerPoint. There are several links. You must keep it. It's the, it's the day, it's holy, it's my, it's a cyclical thing, it's weak. But the feast Sabbath, the ceremonial Sabbath, you flick your soul, no definite article. It can be the seventh year, the sabbatical year. It's her Sabbath, it's your Sabbath, or it's the annual atonement. These are clear differentiating identifiers. No confusion. Never do the terms, these terms overlap. Now, there are a few other overlapping terms, but they are common to everyone. But these are clear, and these are sufficient to differentiate without fail every one of the 111 times the word Shabbat appears in the Old Testament. And we'll get to the new info in a moment, because that's where I have to thank a lay person, a friend of mine from California. I shared this in the Old Testament, and this dentist came to me, and he said, I met him at the evangelism series I was doing on the campus of Loma Linda University. Guy walks up and he says, that's fascinating. Have you checked the New Testament? And you know, I'm, 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 the, I'm the theologian, am I not? And this lay person comes to me and I said, I said no, it's not there. And uh, he says, oh, I think you can find it. And I said, I don't think so. What's your name? And he tells me his name and I'm arguing with a lay person I've never met, you know. Some of us, we think we know a lot. I'm guilty. And so the guy says, okay. He goes back and comes back two or three days later. He says, have a look at this. It's like, whoa. Couldn't believe it. A lay person showed me, and, I, and, and, and in the book, I say thank you to this guy, and that's why I say, folks, let's be humble. 
we have some serious lay people in our churches who love the Lord and who do careful work. And so I'm, I'm confessing my arrogance here. I'm thinking, oh, he's just a lay person. No, no. They are lay people who love the Lord, who know how to study the Bible. And so I thanked him. And when I was done with my study, I gave him a copy of my book. And he's my buddy to this day. Okay? I've stayed in his own many a time. I love lay people who love the Lord and dig seriously into the scriptures. And thanks to him, I'm getting to the New Testament section in a few minutes. But it was a lay person who corrected me. I share that to let lay people know you don't have to be a theologian to dig deeply. If you're serious about the word, you can help us theologians to be better students. So share that with them, encourage them. This is my, one of my lay stories that I, I love it when lay people love the Lord and they dig deeply. So, uh, Colossians 2.16, are any of those links there from the Old Testament? The answer is no. And by the way, let's go to the New Testament now because the word, the Colossians 2.16 is in the New Testament. Now here's a challenge from a former Seventh-day Adventist over a century ago. His name, Dudley Canwright. You heard of him? Yeah. Dudley Canwright says, after he left the Adventist church, he says, the word Sabbath occurs 60 times in the New Testament. In 59 times out of 60, it is freely admitted by all Sabbatarians that the weekly Sabbath is meant. But in the 60th case, where exactly the same word is used, both in the Greek and English, they say it must mean some other day. Now, Canwright, Canwright's accusation is pretty accurate. Pretty. Not exactly, he's, he's missed a, a little bit there, but that's quite accurate. But did we not just show you? Depends on what word is linked. If you use the word trunk 59 times, you're you know, living in the wilds and you talk about elephant. But one day you say, man, I backed the car into the trunk. Generally, you don't think you would back the car into the elephant trunk, right? You see what I'm trying to say? You know in the context and the linking words. But can I raise the challenge? And so we're going to go to the scriptures and see what light there is. Now to Luke 4, 16. Fascinating. Just as we saw those links in the Old Testament, what do we find in the New? Here they are. Okay, notice. So he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up as his custom was, and, in, and he went into the synagogue. There's a key word. On the Sabbath, Greek Sabbath day, and stood up to read. In that one verse, you have three important words that are linked only to Seventh-day Sabbath. Fascinating. Now, on the other hand, we find the word sabbata also used in Matthew 28. Firstly, for the word Sabbath, because you had the word the there. Now, after the Sabbath. So if you see the word the, it's what? Seventh day. Seventh day. And the Greek word there is sabbata. Now, after the Sabbath, Greek sabbata, as the first day of the week. Now, interesting, back then, the Greek had no English word for week. So guess what word they used? On the, as the first day of the week, what Greek word would they use? Sabbata. Sabbata, that's right. Interesting. They use the same word. But how do you know which one it is? You have to look for those linking words. Is the word the there? If the word the is in front of the word sabbata in Greek, it will be, uh, hot, uh, let's see, uh, ta or tone, to, depends on which form of the, of the declension it is. Uh, it will be ta sabbata, for example, plural here. If it's there, then, then it's a seventh day. But if it has a numeral attached, first or second, then the verse continues, then you know it must be translated as the word we. The translators knew that. And so what did they do? I'll take you to that in a minute. There are New Testament linguistic links. I'll go through this quickly here. Similar to the Old Testament. You must keep it. Identified by the. It's the seventh day of the week. It has to do with issues of lawful at the synagogue. And it's a weekly thing. On the other hand, sabbata or sabbaton is used to mean week if it's linked to the word one, to the word first, connected to the word twice, if it's connected with any numeral. Um, and it's confirmed by the context. The same is seen in the Septuagint. Consistent. So you will know how the word is to be used. That's why I'm, Canwright is right, but he is wrong. He's right that we've done that, but he's, he doesn't understand why the translator and the Adventist has done that. So what about Colossians 2? Let's ask the question. Okay, let's go here. Does Colossians 2, 16, with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, Greek Sabbath, is the word keep here? I'm asking the question. No. Next. Do you see the word the there? I need a response. Class? No. no. Okay. Is the, is the word day in the text? No. no. Okay. How about the word lawful? No. No, it's not there. How about synagogue? No. No, it's not there. How about the word weekly? Not there. Conclusion? It's not the seventh day. None of the linking words are there to identify the Sabbath. Now, I'm coming to the King James in a minute because I, we got a little bit of a problem here. All right, come in a minute. Is it linked to the word one? No. 
Is it linked to the word first? No. Is it any numeral? No. Conclusion, it's not the word for week. It has none of the links for either Seventh-day Sabbath or for the word week. Now, the Greek Septuagint, very interestingly, in the Greek Septuagint, we find the word sabbata used for the ceremonial Sabbath. Interesting. So the Septuagint now shows us that that's the way they used it back then. And so we transfer that information now into the New Testament. And here's the comment on the King James. For those who are King James only lovers, I hope you love me after this because <clears throat> we're going to have to show you what the King James does. Here is the King James Version. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Now, notice the word days in italics. When the word is in italics, what does it mean? Added, Added by whom? Translators. Translators. The word the is in italics? No. 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 Hmm. Guess what? Should be. It should be. There is, if you want to find it, when I made a presentation once, somebody came to me after and said, look, look, my King James has the word the in italics. And I opened up front the 1890-something Thomas Newberry edition of the King James Version. They corrected the error of the KJV translators. <laughs> About two and a half centuries too late, but they corrected it, okay? <laughs> And the word the is not there. And why is this important? Because feast keepers in this conference, when I first shared this information, wrote back and they said, Dupre is wrong. The King James Version says the word the is there, therefore it is the seventh day Sabbath. But they had ignored the fact that I was not reading from the King James. There is no Greek manuscript, period, known to exist that supports the King James translation. No known Greek translation. The word the does not exist. Okay? It's, it's not there. So this is something you have to be aware of and just recognize it. By the way, Holy Day, what does it mean? It's the Greek word for pilgrim festival. Days added by the translator. The added. It implies the seventh day, but they forgot or failed to add to midnight italics. Therefore, the King James su suggests, promotes that Colossians 2.16 is the seventh day. You follow the problem? Yeah. And many Sunday keepers and, and feast keepers are going to the King James translation and they're confused but it's not in any Greek manuscript known to humankind. So be careful on that passage. King James has a major problem when it comes to the issue of the Sabbath. New King James is what I prefer. That's why I prefer the New King James as my study Bible. Incidentally, as I mentioned uh, in a discussion here, Ellen White did use at least 10 different Bibles. Are you aware of that? She used the Revised Version that came out in England, 1885. Then she used the, the American Revised Version that came out in 1901. Then she used Lisa Rotherham Noyes. Uh, oh, man, she used something like 10 different Bible translations. So for those who are Seventh-day Adventists and who say King James only, most of those people are solidly Ellen White believers. Take them to Ellen White's writings. Have them read the Desire of Ages. And oh no, she quotes revised version, American revised version. Help them to see that yes, it's uh, the prophet of God that you correctly believe in used other translations, okay? Uh, I'm willing to talk about that further uh, in question and answer time on the whole issue of translations. Um, there's quite a bit of debate on that. Uh, especially because a friend of mine, uh, uh, an acquaintance by the name of Dr. Walter Feit, has oh. been promoting through his DVDs. Anybody heard of him? Oh, yeah. Uh -oh. Wow, almost all the hands went up here. Whoa. <laughs> he's a South African evangelist. Uh, actually, he's a zoologist by training. And uh, he's a gracious gentleman and a really avid, passionate Adventist who became one through study of creation when he found that. I'm studying, studying, realizing evolution has no validity. But uh, he's good in the area of sciences. When it comes to theology, he always ends up within the 28th, but he gets there through circuitous routes, uh, which is not biblically solid. Okay, that's all I want to say. He's a great man who loves the Lord, but he is uh, misunderstanding and misusing scripture because he, that's not his area uh, of, of, of training. Uh, it's like somebody coming to me and says, hey, you're a doctor. Could you do my appendectomy? I'll do it for 10 bucks, but you know, anyway, you don't want to come to me, okay? It's like my nephew says, my uncle's a doctor. He was introducing me to a, one of his nine-year-old friends, but he's not the kind that helps people. <laughs> but you're still a doctor, nevertheless. <laughs> but, but the point I'm making is, you know, his area is zoology. So when it comes to Dr. Fight, God bless him. He's bringing a lot of people to the faith, but on a misunderstood biblical basis. So when he goes into Bible translations, anything theological, anything theological, I would not use. And I told my church members, that I had a group of church members who would watch his series every day, and he's a great man, but I know his material is causing quite a bit of challenge to us as Adventists. So encourage your members to use his material in the area of science. 
for evolution creation, but uh, not in the theology. And I've talked with him now on the phone in South Africa, and I'm supposed to spend six to eight hours at his place. I'm going to try to help him to get away from some of these theological, interesting ideas he's come up with, uh, because uh, this is not helping our church. Sure. It's causing confusion, and it's causing people to become fanatical, and to focus Amen. upon and to focus upon unprovable conspiracy theories. Amen. Okay, are you with me? Yeah. Yes. So, so, so I'm just, I just, and again, I'm not talking like Doctor Fight. Doctor Doctor Fight is right name is Doctor Fight, by the way. <laughs> That's the right way to pronounce his name. Uh, uh, he's just been a great blessing in many ways, but in this area, it's caused more problems than anything. So uh, again, leave his salvation between him and God, and thank God for those who join the faith through that. We want to go back to the Bible. We'll take a break in a few minutes here. Um, the Greek of Colossians. I'll do this, uh, and then you'll be ready to take a break, because I want you to read this. Ah. <laughs> okay, testing time. Mm. Ne. Ne. Yeah, you got the first word. Ne. Second word. Un. Next one. Yes. Ubas. Crineto. En. En. Prose. En. En. Pose. Everybody can read the next word. Ay. Let's go ahead. Let's carry on. En. En. Nere. Hemortes. A necomenias. A and last word. Sabato. Sabato. Good. Break time. <laughs> Let's take a, a break here. I, I, know. I thought you might fall asleep on that. <laughs> you have to take a break. Let's take a break right here. <laughs>